Hello there. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's session. My name is Catherine Taylor. I'm the Regulation Manager with Fresh, which is the locally commissioned tobacco control programme based in the northeast of England. I'm delighted to be chairing this session this morning, which is co-hosted with Action on Smoking and Health and also the Chartered Trading Standards Institute. So the topic of this morning's webinar is tobacco regulation in 2021, and we'll be looking in detail at the changes following EU exit. So the subject of the webinar is around what those immediate changes to the tobacco and nicotine regulatory framework will be following the end of the transition period at the end of this year. This is obviously a really timely and really crucial um, subject for all of us working in tobacco control as we continue to drive down smoking rates. I'm delighted that we've got four colleagues from central government departments and agencies here to talk us through what those changes will be. Um, we've got four, four presenters. So we've got Harriet Weston Harris from the Department of Health and Social Care, who will be talking through changes to picture warnings on tobacco products. We'll then have, hand over to Nish Bandara from HMRC to talk about tobacco track and trace. Craig Copland from the MHRA is here to talk around electronic cigarette notification. And we've got Martin Wilmore from Public Health England to talk about notification of tobacco products. We've got plenty of time at the end for our questions and answers. Um, most of the panellists will be able to join us at the end of um, the presentations, along with Kate Pike from Trading Standards Northwest and also Jane McGregor from the Chartered Trading Standards Institute. I'll point out that Nish can't join us from the Q&A, but please be assured that any questions that you have around track and trace and HMRC can be answered after the, after the webinar ends. So in terms of questions that you might have during the webinar, you, you can pose those at any time um, as the webinar is running as, as they crop up. Um, you can do that by um, going to the questions box, which is on the control panel at the right hand side of your screen on the webinar. Questions will be answered during the Q&A session at the end, but please do please do pose them as we're going through and we'll, we'll be collating them to come round at the end of the year, at the end of the presentations. Any questions that we don't get to answer verbally um, during the webinar itself will be answered in a, in a written up question and answer document that will be circulated to, to all attendees. Um, along with the slides from all of this morning's presentation. So you will get those um, after the webinar has finished, along with any other useful links. It's important to point out at this stage that the webinar is being recorded from this moment, and then it will be freely available to anyone online to access afterwards, which will be really useful, I think, if we need to go back and remind ourselves around what the changes will be. If um, if any attendees suddenly lose audio or have any technical uh, difficulties during the webinar, the easiest fix is just to, to leave the webinar and to rejoin and see if that sorts the problem out. If it doesn't work, then you can email um, admin at smokereaction.org.uk and a member of staff there will, will pick up your query and, uh, and will support you. So that's admin at smokereaction.org.uk. So if everyone is happy with those arrangements, we will make a start on the presentations themselves. So first up, we have Harriet Weston Harris. So she is the policy officer for the Department of Health and Social Care, and she will be talking to us around the changes to picture warnings on tobacco products. So if I could hand over to Harriet, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I will attempt to get the slides up. So good um, good morning everyone. Um, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Harriet Weston Harris and I work on tobacco control and mainly focused on EU exit in the Department of Health and Social Care. I've spent the last two years working on EU exit and tobacco related um, issues along with other areas in the healthy behaviours portfolio. I would like to firstly highlight that the UK are global leaders in tobacco control and will continue to be after the end of the transition period. As you will know, on the 31st of January 2020, the UK left the European Union under the terms set out in the European Union Withdrawal Act 2020. The UK is now in a transition period that will last until the 31st of December 2020, and the government is taking the necessary measures to implement the changes to correct any remaining deficiencies arising from withdrawal, which would otherwise remain at the end of the transition period, and to continue our robust tobacco control legislation post the 1st of January. 
The government laid the tobacco products and nicotine inhaling products regulations 2020 on the 28th of September, and the regulations have now passed both of their parliamentary debates and have now been made. Through these regulations, we made the necessary arrangements to implement the terms of withdraw the withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol in law for tobacco control. The regulations amend the tobacco products and nicotine inhaling products regulations 2020. This means there'll be further, way, further amendments to the way in which the tobacco related products regulations 2016 apply in Great Britain and Northern Ireland after the end of the transition period. And importantly, in accordance with the Northern Ireland Protocol, the European Tobacco Products Directive will apply to Northern Ireland after the end of the transition period. As you all know, it is a requirement under the Tobacco Products Directive that certain tobacco products feature the EU picture warnings. And given the importance of deterring tobacco use, it is critical that picture warnings continue to be included on packaging of UK tobacco products after the end of the transition period. After the end of the transition period, manufacturers placing tobacco products on the GB market will no longer be using the EU picture warnings because the UK does not hold the copyright for these pictures anymore. The 2019 regulations required, the to required that tobacco products for the UK market feature the picture warnings license from the Australian government. The Australian picture library for each is one set of 13 photos and for the time being there will be no, no rotations between sets. However, we will review this at a later time. As I previously outlined, um, the EU's Tobacco Products Directive will remain um, applicable to Northern Ireland after the end of the transition period. And we will meet all of our obligations under the Northern Ireland Protocol whilst recognising the unique status of Northern Ireland within the UK and upholding the Belfast Agreement. In accordance with the Northern Ireland Protocol, the European Union's Tobacco Products Directive will apply to Northern Ireland after the end of the transition period, after, as I mentioned earlier. And this, in practice, means that for tobacco products being placed on the market in Northern Ireland, manufacturers will need to ensure that products continue to feature the EU's picture library images in line with the TPD requirements. There are three sets of pictures which are rotated on an annual basis starting on the 20th of May and ending on the 19th. And um, So please visit the current TPD picture guidance to, um, to, to see any more detail around this process, which I know you'll all probably be quite familiar with already. We are delivering our commitments to ensure unfettered access for products from Northern Ireland to the rest of the UK through the appropriate legislation. The 2020 tobacco regulations do not impose any pre-checks on pre-market checks or approvals or different legislative requirements for goods moving from NI to GB. Tobacco and related products have been granted a highly regulated good status and for qualifying Northern Ireland tobacco and herb herbal products the UK will um, and e-cigarettes, the UK will automatically accept these products meeting EU requirements on the GB market, as long as NI businesses provide pre-market and post-market notification information to UK authorities. However, due to international copyright obligations, any tobacco products placed on the GB market, um, have, including those that come from Northern Ireland, have to feature pic pictures licensed by the Australian government in order to lawfully be placed on the GB market, as the European Commission holds the copyright for the EU's pictures which are licensed for member states' use. The withdrawal agreement allows the continued supply of tobacco products that were lawfully placed on the market in the UK before the end of the transition period. Through the 2020 regulations, Regulation 9 of the 2019 reg regulations has been amended to remove the 12-month sell-through deadline. The new regulation allows products featuring the EU pictures that were produced and first supplied on the UK market before the 1st of January 2021 to remain on the market until they reach their end user. A product does not need to be on the shelf in a shop by the 31st of December to be first supplied. Retailers can continue to sell tobacco products packaged with the EU pictures after the transition period, but these products must have been first supplied in the UK prior to the end of the transition period. Supply is, supply is defined in the Tobacco and Related Products Regulations 2016 and includes where a person offers or agrees to supply a product or exposes or possesses it for supply. Businesses relying on the transitional period in the regulations to supply a tobacco product packaged with the EU picture warnings on the GB market from the 1st of January will need to consider compliance with copyright law. 
and this will not apply to businesses distributing or selling products that were already on the GB market prior to the end of the transition period. I would like to reassure that there will be no relaxation of packaging requirements after the end of the transition period. The standardised the standardized packaging of tobacco products regulations will still apply in GB and Northern Ireland, incorporating the changes to the picture warnings. All other packaging regulations, except for provisions specific to Drac and Trace, which will come under an HMRC's presentation later, will remain the same for GB and Northern Ireland. The government remains committed to its Smoke Through 2030 ambition and will be publishing a new tobacco control plan in July 2021 to outline this. We will also shortly be launching a public consultation on the post-implementation reviews of the standardised packaging of tobacco products and the tobacco-related products regulations. This will be completed by the 20th of May 2021. Um, I'm just going to touch on this briefly because um, it will be covered later. Um, we, have we have also legislated for changes to the requirements for notifying tobacco and e-cigarette products. From the 1st of January, producers wishing to sell tobacco and e-cigarette products on the GB market must notify to a GB system. And for the NI market, we'll need to notify these via the EU's common entry gate system. The MHRA and PHE will be elaborating on these changes in further detail in their presentations. Just briefly on enforcement, the enforcement provisions in the legislation around tobacco control will, re will remain the same and local trading standards will continue to undertake this role. Guidance on the cropping requirements for pictures that are to be used for the tobacco products which are placed on the market in GB have been circulated and uploaded onto the DH Exchange platform on the 1st of October for industry to access. We have also published a gov.uk page outlining the changes to requirements for tobacco and related products from the 1st of January 2021 and I'm happy to share this link. The images for the GB market can be viewed via Schedule A1 of the 2019 regulations and access to the D access to DH exchange for the high, high resolution images is invite only and if you deem it necessary to access these pictures and the formatting guidance for the pictures please email healthybehaviors at dhsc.gov.uk So just on the last slide I've got a selection of links that um, will provide further information on this area and um, yes please feel free to ask me any questions and I will answer them as best I can. Thank you. Harriet, thank you. Thank you very much for talking through what is clearly a, quite a complex area, but um, really grateful that we have been walked through that. Picture warnings are obviously really important um, in trying to reduce the attractiveness and appeal of tobacco products. Um, it's great also to hear that the government continue to be committed to a smoke free 2030 and we'll continue to support them around that. And obviously we all need to be ready for, for the review of the um, the regulations that you mentioned earlier to make sure that um, our regulatory framework continues to be as strong as it as it possibly can be so thank you harriet just a reminder to, to um to attendees that if you do have any questions please do use the, the questions box in the, in the control panel so thanks harriet we will hand over now to nish bandara from hmrc who will be talking us through the tobacco track and trace system so i'll hand over to you now nish thank you Thank you. Robbie, if you could go on to slide one. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's keeping safe and well. My name is Miss Bandara. I work in HMRC, uh, HM Revenue and Customs, in our Tobacco Track and Trace Policy Team. Uh, it has been a very busy year on Track and Trace uh, in, in the department, and so I'm going to talk you through um, the changes that will be introduced after the transition period. If you could move on to slide two, Robbie. And apologies, I'll, I'll add here, I'm dialing into my phone, so I can't see the slide. If I'm talking against the wrong side, please just someone shout out and I'll correct myself. So with slide two, I, um, I thought I'd start with a quick refresh and background of um, why we have a track and trace system and the rules around that system today. Moving to slide three, please, Robbie. So this may be familiar to some of you, um, so I won't stay too long on this, but just a reminder that the UK is committed to the World Health Organization 
Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And within that convention, the protocol to eliminate illicit trade in tobacco products, which amongst a number of measures, requires parties who ratify the protocol to implement a traceability system for tobacco products manufactured in or imported into their country's territory. Um, the, the plan is for countries to implement their own systems, but a global system is something that's eventually envisaged through the protocol. Um, the protocol um, states a number of requirements for that system. One is that for the system to work, tobacco products must be marked with a secure, unique identifier that can be tracked from the point of manufacture. Um, and the reason for that is if products then consequently end up on the illicit market, it can be tracked back using that UID to identify where the problem started and what the manufacturing details are. Moving on to slide two, Robbie. So, the EU um, very much at the forefront of um, introducing a track and trace system um, and the UK joined uh, an EU-wide system that was introduced in May 2019 under the EU Tobacco Products Directive and related legislation to that directive. In terms of how the system operates now, it currently only covers cigarettes and hand rolling tobacco, but with the intention to introduce other tobacco products by from or by May 2024. And um, it actually goes a little further than the requirements in the WHO protocol in that it requires coverage of all economic operators in the tobacco supply chain up to the first point of retail. Um, as part of the system, every member state has an ID issuer and that ID issuer registers economic operators as well as the facilities and machines which manufacture, store and process products in the supply chain. Um, the ID issuer also provides manufacturers with the UID that the protocol requires and that UID gets placed on product at a unit and also available at the aggregate level and is scanned by economic operators through the supply chain. The system is independent from but also fully funded by the tobacco industry. In terms of the cost model on the EU system, this is mostly done through the purchase of UIDs from the UK ID issuer. You move on to slide five, Robbie. I am going to cover what about this system is changing after the transition period. If you move on to slide six. So of course, Things are changing, uh, we've left the EU, um, and while the rules around the track and trace system remain the same during the transition period, from the 1st of January when the period ends, Great Britain will be disconnected from the EU system, uh, and we've made the decision to continue the track and trace system and operate a standalone UK-wide scheme from the 1st of January. Uh, we were very keen to um, continue the system and not create a pause in our compliance efforts as a result of leaving the EU. Equally, we were very keen, we needed a seamless um, uh, a transition as possible and also um, some of the benefits of how the EU scheme operates. So we are making only the minimum and necessary changes to the design of that system. At a very high level, those changes involve First of all, creating a UK data repository to collect the data. So at the moment, where that data is transmitted to the EU repository system, um, it will now be sent to a UK repository. And um, also a router to effectively connect uh, from a scanning perspective when that uh, product is scanned, sending product via this new UK gateway rather than the EU router to the UK data repository. The system is initially being delivered by the UK's current ID issuer, Delarue. Uh, so Delarue will, from the 1st of January, as well as providing the ID issuer services, provide the new UK router and data repository. To ease, again, the burdens of that transition, uh, we've arranged to ensure that all economic operator, facility and machine IDs that are currently registered on the UK registry under the EU system to automatically be retained and reused on the UK system. Um, and just um, to cover some of the questions we received prior to this webinar, there was a question around the security features scheme. I can confirm there will be no changes being introduced to the security features scheme. If you can move on to slide seven, Robbie. 
So as Harriet said, under the terms of the Northern Ireland Protocol to the Withdrawal Agreement, the EU Tobacco Products Directive will continue to apply in Northern Ireland. This means that products manufactured in or imported into Northern Ireland will be tracked under the EU system. However, slightly differently to um, the uh, policy for picture health warnings, um, that product will also be tracked under the UK system. So we are keen, we were keen to still have a UK wide system which collects all data for the UK under, under one system. Um, so product manufactured in or imported to Northern Ireland will be tracked under both of those schemes. In terms of how that would work, again, a few pointers at a high level. So Delarue will act as the ID issuer for both the UK system and Northern Ireland under the EU system, and the UK UID for the purposes of Northern Ireland will be recognised under both systems. For this to work, the scanning equipment of economic operators in Northern Ireland also needs to be updated um, to operate two addresses, a dual address, for both the UK and EU systems, so that data can be sent via the EU router and via the UK gateway as well. Um, and I thought I'd have it, this covers both the UK, the preparations for the UK system, Northern Ireland, um, but we actually published um, the, legis the new statutory instrument that was required for all of these arrangements last Thursday. The link is in that um, uh, slide if anyone wants to take a look. If you could move to slide eight, Robbie. So as you can imagine, these changes, while we've been keeping them to the minimal changes necessary, have required um, a lot of communication with the tobacco industry, um, keeping that to the essential communication only um, to preserve the, the need to make sure the system remains independent of the industry, uh, but also to ensure that they have the information they need to make their required system changes. So for the purposes of tobacco manufacturers, um, there's been a lot of work going on to ensure there's been successful system integration between the UK system and their um, IT systems at the manufacturing um, point. Um, one thing to mention was uh, one problem we grappled with was how to ensure UK UID could be on product um, bearing a football product moving between the EU and the UK, given the EU system would also require a code on product uh, and there is limited space on packs to have more than one code. Um, to solve that issue, we will be operating what we're calling a code pairing solution, where at the point of manufacture, the manufacturer can digitally associate the UK code with the EU ID code. So when you look at a packet, um, it will just have what will look like one code, but when it's scanned, um, there'll be data that um, uh, can be collected to be sent to both the UK and where applicable EU systems. Um, this, the, the rules of code pairing will actually apply for other countries' tobacco track and trade systems as they continue to develop, but um, given the majority of product that enters the UK is currently sent from the EU, it's quite important to ensure that our system works with the EU one as well. We've also been working closely with the rest of the supply chain, in particular to ensure the changes and required updates to scanning equipment to both send data to the UK system from the 1st of January for economic operators in Great Britain and to ensure data can be sent to both the UK and EU systems for economic operators in Northern Ireland. Move on to slide nine, Robbie. So uh, while the, the system's on track on the 1st of January, we will obviously be monitoring and keeping a close um, eye on um, arrangements around go live and uh, tidying up and supporting any economic operations in the first weeks and months of the system. I wanted to draw your attention to two other pieces of work that we've got going on in 2021 as well. If you can move to slide 10. I thought I would add that the arrangement we have with Delarue to provide the UK system is temporary. Our contract with Delarue expires next December uh, due to just commercial constraints of how, how long that contract could operate. So this month, uh, we are launching a procurement exercise for the longer term provider of the system from the 1st of January 
2022. Uh, Dexavise was planned to run until February 2021, um, and prior to launching it, we have issued relevant communications and held an event for potential suppliers who may be interested in being the provider of the system in the long term. Moving on to slide 11. So a lot of the questions I got ahead of um, this webinar was a very valid one around how trading standards can utilize the, the track and trace system to support their work as well. Um, while nothing's changed um, in terms of at the moment, um, not in a position to have the access to the system to check anything. However, you might be aware that just two weeks ago, um, uh, and ahead of some updates that were announced by the government early in the year, we um, published a consultation on tougher sanctions to tackle tobacco duty evasion. The consultation seeks views on the proposals for exactly what those new sanctions are, including how they can be linked to the track and trace system. And they also seek views on extending powers to trading standards officers. So the consultation closes on the 23rd of February next year, um, and anything that comes out of it, we will, uh, of course, use to develop um, what our position is in terms of um, extending powers to trading standards officers going forward. Um, so I hope that partly answers some of the questions of um, the role in trading standards with track and trace. I thought I would just finally mention that um, you hopefully are aware of the protocol between trading standards and HMRC around joint ways of working. Just to give an update, I, I believe um, teams outside of my own are looking to update that protocol. Um, nothing specific regarding track and trace yet, just yet because of the fact that we're, we're not in a position yet to, to offer anything uh, to trading standards to specifically check on the system. But um, do we do welcome your feedback if there's anything you think might need to be included. So please get in touch with me and I can pass that relevant feedback on. As a very final point that's unrelated to tobacco track and trade, we did receive a question around what the rules for personal allowances will be for passengers um, both leaving and entering uh, the UK from the 1st of January. Um, I have passed that question on to the relevant passengers team and I've, apologies, I've not got a response yet. Um, so I will pick up um, and, and make sure we provide that to you. Um, Hopefully, some of you will be aware of updated guidance that was issued a few months ago, though, on what the changes around the personal allowances uh, will be. So, um, I would encourage you to look at that guidance, and I'm happy to send a link because there's some specific information on the different levels of and liters of beer, wine, spirits, and, and tobacco, and so on that passengers can bring in. Um, but there are some changes uh, that are being introduced from, from the 1st of January as a result of leaving the EU. That is all for me. Because I can't attend the very end of the session, Robbie, I am open to taking questions now or the alternative approach you suggested of sending me questions you receive after your webinar. Thank, thank you, Nis. Nis, that was a really helpful presentation. And yes, we did have um, a couple of questions. I think um, one of them you've, you've covered it to a certain extent, actually, and it was about um, trading standards having access to the track and trace verification system. So, and I guess I understand, am I right in thinking that through the consultation process, this is where we can kind of feed, feed views around that Absolutely. and leave the trading standards to be kind of involved? Yeah, that's correct. Is, is that the best way of, of channeling those views through? So thank you. Thank you for, for that question. Um, I think if we've got any others, we'll send them through through in writing. That's fine. We do have a little bit of time, and I'll just see. I know there wasn't another question for um for HMRC. I'll just see if I can pull it up from the chat box. What I will say, though, just while I, while I'm checking that, is um thank you for speaking to colleagues around personal allowances as, as well. Um, and we'll make sure that kind of links to that information can be sent out. Um with the further information after the webinar. I know track and trace has been a, a huge um, a huge part of the HMRC workload over, over the last few months. Um, and, and, you know, and huge thanks to everyone for, for, for continuing to, to, uh, to pursue that. I'll just see what that additional question might be. Sorry, I'll, um, because it would be useful to, um, to pose that if I can. Catherine, do you want, would you like me to read it, Hazel? Hazel, thank you. 
Thank you. So it's a question from James Garrett. Um, with regards to track and trace, if on a retail level there isn't a code on the pack, what is the offence? Is it an HMRC offence? And how would we check track and trace numbers via a website or is there a separate device? So, in, so I, I guess this goes back to the, the point that at the moment, um, you, you will know that there isn't a way for trade in standards to um, be able to check UIDs. Um, and um, but from, from an internal point of view, we've been working very closely on how the system works um, how we can check the UIDs, um, the, an app is being looked to develop as, uh, by Gallery as part of the system um, that enforcement officers within HMRC can use to, to check those U UIDs and, and uh, whether, whether they're valid or not. Um, it's uh, really, uh, the consultation would be the really useful um, way you can feedback um, the best way we can maybe look to uh, sort of transfer any enforcement powers to trained in standards um, around track and trace and potentially more widely as well. Great, thank you, Nis. Um, we've got another question here from, from Deborah. Um, please, can we ask, what about track and trace in the longer term structure? So making sure it's compliant with the requirements of the FCTC illicit trade protocol? Yeah, so um, very, I mean, the, the intent of the system that's going live next year is um, our, our belief that it should align and is compliant with the FCPC um, and new protocol. Um, so um, while we'll be keeping an eye on longer term developments around that, um, I'm alluded to the fact that there's an eventually envisaged global system for the FCTC as well. And we are involved in conversations with other parties of the protocol. Um, in the longer term arrangements. Um, but in terms of how the system works on 1st of January, um, we believe it is compliant with all the requirements of the system as set out um, in that protocol. Great. Thank you for that answer, Nish. That is fine. Um, so, yeah, so obviously just to flag the track and trace consultation is live. The deadline is the 23rd of February, and I know um, colleagues will be discussing that and, and how to make sure the trading standards um, feed in their views on that. So, Nish, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking those questions. If there is anything further, we'll send them through to you in writing and, and we can work together on, on getting a response back out to attendees. So thank you. That was really helpful. We can move much. on now to the next. Pre thank you. We'll move on now to the next presentation. So we've got Craig Copland, who is from the e-cigarette team um, at the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. Um, Craig is here to talk to us around electronic notification and the changes that will be, will, will be coming in from 1st of January onwards. So I'll hand over to you now, Craig. Morning, ladies and gents. Uh, just want to check that you can uh, see my screen. We can, yes. Wonderful. Okay. You want to put it on slideshow, perhaps? There we go. So I just wanted to uh, keep you up to date on what's been going on at the agency. Um, we operate the notification system for e-cigarette products in the UK um, and so I wanted to let you know what was the changes that you can expect as trading standards officers um, what are you going to be seeing when you log on to the MHRA um, pages to look for products that are on the market or not on the market um, and to be frank the changes are very minimal for the effect it's going to have on public information um, so the main change is are that for supply of a product in Great Britain, all submissions will now come through the MHRA submission portal, which is um, something that we are hosting. So all the submitters that had previously provided um, submissions to EU SEG for Great Britain will now have a unique account with the MHRA and they will use the same system, the same data to upload that information um, to the MHRA portal. For the supplier products in Northern Ireland, um, they will follow the same process that they currently do 
and notifying those products through EU SEG. So the MHRA remains the responsible authority for both those sets of data, and we will publish um, a notified product list for Great Britain and for Northern Ireland. So there'll be two separate lists, um, but at this point we are, the, the data that we're seeing, it really is showing that those lists will be very, very similar. Um, obviously, if you're working within Great Britain, you're going to be using the GB list and vice versa for Northern Ireland. So um, a lot of people have been asking about the responsible person requirement. So this has changed. And the difference there is that um, for products that are notified for supply in Great Britain, submitters will need to update their information. Uh, that's information that we will hold and we can provide to enforcement authorities upon request. So as of January the 1st, we will be requiring responsible person for each submitter of products in Great Britain to provide um, a, an address and the name of a legal entity in Great Britain. Um, no change essentially to Northern Ireland. Um, they can still use the responsible person that has been designated uh, via the EU SEG system. Um, we will be continuing to publish products that have already been published. So if a uh, EU suitable product has been published by the MHRA, they will retain publication in both Great Britain and Northern Ireland. We will be migrated, sorry, we have migrated rather, not we will be, we've migrated uh, about 99% of the information for um, UK products to the MHRA system to ensure that we have um, uh, perfect data continuity for those products and we still have access to data for all historic products that again, we can provide uh, to enforcement authorities as required. Um, and can use for historic um, searches. Published national standards continue to apply across the UK. So this is the same for um, current national standards that have been published by the MHRA and that will be published in future. The, um, both the regulations and the directive um, allow for national standards to be essentially added to the specific requirements of those pieces of legislation, um, such as uh, extra banned substance requirements, um, extra testing requirements. The MHRA currently hosts um, information on banned substances, and we have a more uh, extensive list which um, is available again to enforcement authorities on request. Um, it's also promoted to um, submitters of products. Um, a lot of people have been asking about alignment between the two regions of the EU and or Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Our system has been designed specifically to allow submitters to retain ECIDs uh, across the regions. And this was felt that for the purposes of law enforcement, for purposes of IDing products, it would be far, far more preference for um, alignment to be maintained so that a product within Northern Ireland and a product in the EU and a product in Great Britain can retain the same ECID uh, to make it easier to identify uh, a product that you may be dealing with. Um, we've also created a unique GBID. So any submitter who only wishes to supply their products in Great Britain can set themselves up on the system with a, a unique GBD identifier, which will be also published uh, as part of either as part of the, the Great Britain publication system. So just a quick um, view to show you the GB user journey. Um, very simple system. It's actually a lot simpler than the, the one that's currently being used um, by submitters, and it allows them to take their XMLs uploaded to the EU portal or they can use a simple drop down system to create a submission. This makes it a, a lot faster for submitters to um, upload data and we also hope that in some ways it will perhaps simplify 
and take away um, some of the concerns that have been held by enforcement and industry regarding third party companies doing this on behalf of the submitter. Um, we hope that more companies will take control of their submissions and not have to rely so much on these third parties uh, so they're understanding a little bit more about the process involved in submission. That's pretty much it. Um, I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions at the end, as I, I know, having been an ex trading standards officer, that they come thick and fast. So I kept my slides to uh, to a minimum. Over to you, Roy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. That was really helpful. And um, and yes, we will we'll deal with any questions at the end. So yeah, just a reminder that if um if the attendees do have any questions, to pop those into the question panel, and and we should be able to come through to them. Craig, thanks thanks again. Um, clearly the MHRA has been busy for lots of different reasons this year. Um, and thank you for being on, being on top of these changes. Just a reminder to everyone as well that the webinar is, is being recorded and you will get all of the slides sent out to you afterwards so you can, you can refer back to things. I know there's quite a lot to take in, 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 in on some of the subject areas, so thank you. Um, right, okay, well, we'll move on to the last kind of formal presentation for the webinar this morning. Um, Martin Wilmore from Public Health England is here to talk about the notification of novel tobacco products. So we can see Martin's slides there on the screen now. Um, I'll hand over to you now, Martin. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Catherine. And you've answered my first question that you can see my uh, slides, which is good. I've got uh, a relatively easy job this morning. So I think I'll just be reiterating a lot of what Harriet and Craig have already said. So Craig was, was speaking there very much from um, the perspective of notification of uh, electronic cigarettes and I'm going to do a very similar run through of how things will change hopefully relatively slightly in terms of um, notifying tobacco products and what that might mean for the market and for colleagues on the call. Um, just before I get into the detail of that, I just thought it was kind of worth reiterating why PHE is um, involved <clears throat> in this work. Uh, so going back to 2014, the EU Tobacco Products Directive entered into force across the EU and essentially that said that any supplier or manufacturer intending to supply tobacco products into any member state within the EU needed to notify that member state of their intention to sell those products. And for every member state, there had to be a designated competent authority and that would be the organisation to which tobacco notifiers had to send details of their products and PHE are that competent authority for the United Kingdom. So for the last few years we've been uh, accessing data on tobacco products being sold into the UK and we'll do some um, some checks on those products to make sure that they conform with UK regulations uh, before uh, agreeing that they should be placed on the UK market. So that's why we have a role to play within this. So within that competence authority function, there are, there are essentially four key tasks that we do. And when I was thinking about how best to put these slides together, I thought it was thought best to look at the four functions that we do and how they will change, as I say, relatively slightly uh, from January the 1st. So the four things that we essentially do is uh, we support manufacturers and importers of tobacco and related products to make notifications of those products onto the UK market and ensure that they're compliant with UK regulations. We commission the laboratory testing of cigarettes for tar, nicotine and carbon monoxide levels uh, and we collect fees associated with both of those two tasks because um, that those fees essentially pay for the competent authority staff that undertake these functions. And lastly, we also administer a notification system for cross-border distance sales, which I'll touch upon in a moment. So I'm going to go through each of those in a little bit more detail. And uh, my intention when putting these slides together is the, the text that's essentially uh, in bold at the top of each of these slides is how things operate now, how the system works at the moment, and the text beneath that is trying to draw out, tease out some of the, the minor changes that will be happening from January the 1st. So very much as Craig outlined there for electronic cigarettes, currently tobacco suppliers submit details of products that they intend to supply into the UK markets via that EU portal, the EU SEG. So we, as the competent authority for tobacco for the UK, can access that um, portal and draw down the, the, the information relative, uh, relevant to the United Kingdom. But from January the 1st, the EU 
will no longer accept notifications for products to be supplied into Great Britain specifically. And we have uh, also set up a new domestic uh, notification system for products onto the GB markets. Products that are going to be supplied into Northern Ireland will continue to be notified via the EU system. So straight away for, for tobacco uh, manufacturers and suppliers, uh, there's a slight change there. So they have to notify products to two different systems. The regulations that we apply when checking those tobacco notification, notifications to make sure that they're compliant will remain virtually unchanged. Harriet touched upon uh, the changes to the picture warnings that will be on the GB packs and how they will uh, follow the uh, Australian suite of picture warnings. And that's, I think, visibly, that's, that's the main change that we'll see from the new year as those products start to come through onto the markets. And very much as Craig outlined for MHRA, we will also continue to publish a list of approved compliant products. And there will now be two such uh, published lists, one for Great Britain and one for Northern Ireland. And we're also expecting, anticipating that those lists will be uh, very similar. So we've been working really closely with the Department of Health over recent weeks to develop guidance for um, notifiers uh, on the new processes and we are expecting that guidance will be published imminently. I use the word imminently because I wasn't quite sure whether they would be published in time for this meeting today and just uh, looking uh, a few minutes ago that they're not live at the moment but hopefully by the end of the day the new guidance will be live on the website that's there and that's also the place where you can go uh, and access the uh, published list of uh, compliant tobacco products on the markets. I put this slide in because two reasons. One, I was very conscious of a lot of text on my slides, and I, I, I do like to put a good picture on from time to time. And secondly, it's because when I took over this role uh, at the turn of the year, this was one of the more interesting things that, that I saw. And it's really a breakdown of the tobacco products that are on the UK market, and it was data taken from the middle of this year. Uh, so straight away, there's just over 3,000 tobacco products on the UK market. And it was just interesting to me that nearly half of them, just under half of them, were actually cigar products. So uh, I would imagine that relatively low volume of sales of each of those, but um, many different variants on the market. And cigarettes, albeit they, they uh, probably uh, dominate the sales figures, uh, constitute about, only about one in five tobacco products on the market. Okay, so the second activity that we undertake as PHE is that we uh, currently commission a company called Essentra to carry out lab testing on notified cigarettes only. So not every tobacco product, but cigarettes. Uh, and we check for maximum tar, nicotine, carbon monoxide levels, and they won't be changing. And if any products uh, consistently exceed those minimum levels, so those maximum levels, then we can take remedial action uh, with those companies. The testing process and the regulations that inform them will continue unchanged from January the 1st post-Brexit. Where there are identical products on the Great Britain and the Northern Ireland markets, we will not be asking Accenture to undertake uh, duplicate testing. We'll just test those products once. If, if they have the same product's ID, essentially, if they're manufactured in the same um, uh, organization, in the same building, uh, we won't be testing them twice. Because Essentia gets sent uh, the physical packs of cigarettes for testing, it's also an opportunity, as well as the, the TNCO testing, for them to undertake some very cursory uh, visual checks on those packs to make sure they're compliant. And occasionally they will pick up issues with um, the wrong language of text being on packs or uh, clearly counterfeit products that have been sent. Uh, so, and they will continue to do that and clearly they'll be keeping an eye out for the um, the packaging and the health warnings on Northern Ireland products as a, uh, in addition to GB products too. Thirdly, and I guess this is uh, quite technical, but essentially we, we do apply fees to any tobacco products that are notified. And there are three key fees. One is for uh, whenever a new product is notified, there's an annual fee for any tobacco product that's been on the market uh, for a year. And we determine that uh, in, in March of every year. And lastly, there's a, there's a testing fee for undertaking that lab testing. Those fees, the, the number of them and the value of them, again, will remain unchanged from January the 1st. And any product that's notified to both the GB and Northern Ireland markets 
any identical products will att uh, attract just one fee. We won't be charging them twice for what is essentially the same products, just on the GB and Northern Ireland markets. And lastly, I want to touch upon cross-border distance sales. So um, this is a requirement for uh, UK businesses to register to sell tobacco and or e-cigarettes to other countries in the uh, European economic area and vice versa. So any retailers in uh, in the EU or in a third country must also register to sell into the UK. Now this isn't talking about retailers such as Tesco selling uh, in the high streets. This is um, selling products that cost that, that, that cross uh, boundaries and countries' borders. So it tends to be online sales. And as part of that registration process, we will check for things like the presence of online age ver verification systems. And that's something that we could um, certainly tighten up in the future. But uh, certainly retailers have to have a, a, an age verification system if they're selling tobacco online. So beyond January the 1st, that the major change there is that businesses in Great Britain supplying tobacco or e-cigarettes into Northern Ireland or vice versa will need to register cross-border distance sales so this the sale of products between GB and Northern Ireland previously didn't have to register but from January the 1st uh, they will have to and again we'll be publishing more detailed guidance about that whole process uh, online and the link is there so in summary the major uh, challenges and implications of EU uh, uh, exits is that PHE remain the competent authority for tobacco products across the whole of the UK GB and Northern Ireland, but the way that suppliers notify to those two markets will change from January the 1st. The regulations will stay largely unchanged, picture warnings being the, the most notable difference. We've tried to keep the burden to industry from all these changes and the new notification systems and the fees as uh, minimal as possible. And it would probably be remiss of me not to at least mention on this call uh, the ongoing investigation into menthol flavored cigarettes uh, as part of the eu we continue to be uh, guided by the e eu and uh, subject to their investigations around the presence of uh, uh, menthol flavored uh, tobacco cigarettes that came in uh, earlier this year uh, but from january the first for great britain we may have to instigate our own investigations as we'll no longer be part of uh, that formal eu investigation but interestingly as the competent authority for Northern Ireland, we'll still be gu guided by uh, any EU verdict on uh, whether products are on the market currently, which are transgressing those regulations about uh, menthol flavouring. So I will leave it there, Catherine. Thank you. Excellent, Martin. Thank you for being across that another another complex um, area, but thank you for for talking us through it. So if Martin. Craig and Harriet can obviously stick around for the question and answer session, which we've been collating. I'll also welcome Jane McGregor from the Chartered Trading Standards Institute and also Kate Pike from Trading Standards Northwest to the panel. Um, they obviously have a lot of expertise from a trading standards background um, to bring to the discussion. Thank you to all of the attendees for um, posing your questions. Please do keep them coming in. We'll, we'll keep that question box live and I'll continue to monitor it. Um, I'll turn now to the questions that have been posed during the webinar so far. Um, and I will turn first to... Um, so Harriet, if I, can, if I can pose this to you first, it's come from Robert Pynchon and it's around the expected date for exhaustion of tobacco supplies being placed on the UK market prior to the 1st of January 2021. Do you know what that expected date might be? Sorry, Catherine, I couldn't hear, quite hear you there. Could you say that again? Yes, of course I can. So Sorry. this is a question that's come from, that's all right, from, from Robert Pynchon. So the question is, what is the expected date for the exhaustion of tobacco supplies having been placed on the UK market prior to the 1st of January 2021? So we don't have an expected date as such, but the majority of tobacco products such as cigarettes 
tend to have a shelf life of up to around 12 months. So in reality, we, we've kind of scoped it out that be a, um, around a year to two years maximum b um, before we see the majority of Australian pictures on GB stock um, with a mixture of both of them in the interim. Because um, as I mentioned earlier, there isn't an end date in terms of this a sell through it's just until these products reach their end user and um, but because of the type of products that th this particular regulation is impacting we're thinking um around 12 months but we haven't got an exact date for that yeah okay that's really helpful i think it is helpful to understand when when smokers themselves are likely um you know either to, to start i mean do you know when smokers might start seeing the new picture warnings do you anticipate that that will be quite quite quickly um, I mean, it de it depends on what industry you're pl planning to do in terms of um, how quick they put these products out there, because obviously everything that is produced from the 1st of January will have to have the Australian pictures on there. So I think it will be um, not too long before smokers start to see them on the market. Right. Yeah, great. OK, thank you. Thank you for answering that question. I've got um, two questions here from Deborah Arnott at ASH. Um, so two questions for the panel. Um, so we've heard that um, from trading standards that the current system, so that I guess this is targeted to MHRA, the current system is difficult to search. Do you think that, that the new system will solve that problem? Um, and secondly, we've, we've been pushing for some of the notification fees to be used to support enforcement, given the cuts in funding to trading standards in recent years. And has there been any progress on those discussions? So, Craig, are you able to to address that those questions? Uh, first, first off, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. The um, the system of publication at the moment is a bit of a nightmare to to uh, to use. Um, it's basically a simple Excel format, which um, would have been simpler to navigate had it not been for the fact that we have so many products in the UK market. So it's been split into two. Um, in the short term, uh, I can answer that no, that's not going to get any easier, unfortunately. Um, but as soon as um, January comes around and we are out of the uh, transition period um, and the system goes live, we will be in uh, a redevelopment cycle that um, we've been um, quite keen to get going. And that is about the automated publication system. What we're hoping is that we can integrate um, a simpler user interface. So essentially, um, submitters will come through, automated checks will take place, um, uh, they'll make their payment, then our assessors will be checking and once the assessors have signed off on a product, there'll be an automated publication system that will not use Excel. Uh, we're going to try and build a front end for public users, enforcement users, um, where they can just use it as a search function rather than a total um, sort of publication list so yes uh not in the short term but we are redeveloping it across 2021 to try and improve that for users um i think the goal was always to try and get some kind of app for enforcement um that will be the end goal and we will look into that once the redevelopment has been complete um and the other question was regarding the use of funds for enforcement so uh, it, so it's about Yes, exactly. Yep. Um, the technical answer is you are unable to use funds from that system to, for direct enforcement. We do operate uh, a yearly um, series of uh, uh, investment for CTSI and, and projects. We're looking to continue that. We're looking to take the uh, lessons that have been learned over the last few years and, and refocus where we spend that money mm -hmm. to try and get the best um, results. Uh, it's always something that's very close to my heart. I'm well aware of how underfunded local authorities are, having come from there. Um, and we will be looking for ways to to try and support training standards uh, in future. It's very difficult to use um, notification fees for direct enforcement of an industry because um, uh, use of public money makes that almost impossible to do. Uh, so you can't essentially use a notification fee for an enforcement activity. Um, but like I say. We are looking into more projects that we can operate with CTSI uh, to make sure that there are is money available for work involved in um, investigations uh, and uh, you know educational work with uh, retailers. 
So yeah, that's about all I can say on that for now. Great, thank you, Craig. I'm just wondering, given that we we have Jane and also Kate, um, our trading standards colleagues on the panel, I wonder if there's any context that either of you would like to add to that scenario. Hi, Catherine. Jane here. Morning. Hi. Can you hear me all right? We can. Thank you, Jane. Oh, that's great. Thank you. I'd just like to thank Craig actually for his continued support of trading standards. Um, Craig's been a regular attendee at the Our Tobacco Focus Group meetings, and he has very willingly shared with us anything that he can in terms of updates. So, just really a personal thank you, Craig, on behalf of CTSI and trading standards colleagues for you know, continued support from MHRA for work with trading standards. Thanks, Jane. It's very kind of you. Great. Thank you, Jane. OK, so I will <clears throat> move on. So um, we have a question for, um, for, for Martin from Public Health England, please. Mm. Um, I've got a question here from Rebecca Willens, which is around cigarettes. Uh, so why are only cigarettes tested for TNCO, so tar, nicotine, carbon monoxide levels? Why are only cigarettes tested for those levels? That's a good question. I guess the simple answer is that's that's what was set out in the regulations across the EU, which were transposed into UK law. So that's. So that's all that we're required to do or is necessitated by um, the legislation. But it is a good question because as uh, as more novel tobacco products come onto the market, we we could certainly see a case for undertaking testing of those to see what's what uh, ingredients are in them and kind of what levels of emissions. So that's something that we um, mm -hmm. certainly keen to pick up with Department of Health as part of this kind of product um, uh, implementation review that's happening. Uh, uh, in the first half of this year. So I think it's probably watch this space. Um, it's just cigarettes at the moment because that's what we're legally required to do, but it's something that's always under review. Great. Thank you, Martin, and thank you also for the for the question. Um, we've got a question here for, for Harriet at the Department of Health. So this is a question from Kate Bailey. Um, you were able to give a very quick tour of um, the Great Britain and Northern Ireland picture warnings. Can you just confirm, Harriet, what happens if EU compliant products are put on the Northern Ireland market first and then brought into the UK? Yes, that's that's a very good question. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so because of the cop um, international copyright obligations, um, all products that need that are going to be put on the GB market must feature the Australian picture warnings. So EU um, compliant products cannot be placed um, on the GB market if they have picture warnings. All other um, EU compliant products can be placed on the GB market as long as they are notified either to PHE for tobacco products or the MHRA for e-cigarette products. Okay, Kate. Thank <laughs> Sorry, Kate was the questioner. Thank you, Harriet. Um, for addressing that. I wonder if I could just stick with picture warnings. We've got a kind of a comment and a question here from, from Chris Pratt. Um, and his the question he's posing is wondering if it might be worth considering moving on from photo warnings on packs. Smokers have said they become blind to these. Perhaps consideration could be given to using technology such as Zapper, which is similar to QR codes. Um, he goes on to explain that this directs someone scanning the code with a smartphone to any web address specified. So they could be directed to educational videos, stop smoking support, the benefits of switching to vaping, etc. I'm just wondering how you would address that kind of question. Yes, that's a very interesting point. I would say I'm not very technical and stuff like that. It's a little bit, yes, I'm not I'm not quite familiar with um, that particular um, type of technology that could be used on tobacco products, but we still deem um, picture warnings as being critical for tobacco control purposes and they have been um, they have been evaluated as effective for smoking and any sort of future um, regulations or proposals for picture warnings would, would be looked at. Okay, thank you. I'm just wondering if any of the other panellists might have anything to add to that question at all. I'm, I'm wondering, Martin, um, 
back around whether there's anything <laughs> you want to add yeah yeah I'd, I'd certainly happy to jump on I, I guess I'd be I'd be cautious about something like anything like a QR code that was that was solely reliant on uh, the smoker uh, accessing it or, or scanning it so I, I think there is value to the picture warnings I think, uh, I think the evidence would suggest not only to the smoker themselves uh, I, I, I take Chris's point about kind of the, the need to have different pictures popping up from time to time to kind of keep them fresh but so I think the evidence is that they, they do have an impact on the smoker but also on the next generation of smokers coming through when they see these fairly um unpleasantly coloured packs with their fairly graphic warnings on them as well so I'm um, thinking about not just mm -hmm. at the time of purchase in the shop but kind of when they're, they're lying about on a coffee table and they're kind of visible to impressionable young people so um so it's, it's a good point Chris I'm certainly certainly think it's, a, it's an interesting one about being able to access information about quitting or even even able to access information about your local stop smoking service I think that's a really good idea but I, I would see it as an uh, addition rather than as a replacement to the current picture audience mm -hmm. thank you thanks both and obviously just to point out there's you know really good evidence there of the importance of rotation and refreshing warnings and um, any of the warnings that, that appear on on tobacco packages to have that have to have the biggest impact so thank you okay so i'll move on and um, martin if i if i can come back to you this is a, a question for for phe um, and it's from robert pynchon and um so years ago chartered trading standards Institute hosted the Niche Tobacco Products Database. This was mm. extremely useful for trading standards officers who might have been unfamiliar with current non-cigarette or hand-rolling tobacco products. Um, there's no such resource available as far as I'm aware. Can another system be funded and set up? I'm actually thinking this, this may be more, more for Jane. I'll, I'll let Martin or, or Jane deal with that question, whoever's best placed. I guess we well, I guess within the current um publications list that we that we produce for all tobacco products any niche products will be will be in there but I, yeah I, I take the point that they'll, they'll, they'll be buried in there along with a lot of other information so we don't we don't produce a specific list I mean if it would be genuinely useful to people it doesn't sound like it would be too difficult to extract um, uh, notifications about novel products for instance um, I'm happy to kind of take that offline and have a conversation about um which products would be of interest and how easy it would be for us to um extract them from the main list of tobacco products but if it, if it would be useful uh, it doesn't sound like a, a huge job uh martin perhaps you and i could have a conversation offline about that because yeah. as far as i'm aware the historical data that rob refers to in the um, niche tobacco products database is still kind of there somewhere mm -hmm. me and my technical description it's there somewhere um, so i think maybe you and i have a discussion and determine whether or not it's something we could usefully either revitalize in some way perhaps yes let's commit to do that yes absolutely. we'll commit to do that okay great thank you both Okay, um, I'm going to come back to the picture warnings um, topic. We've got a question from from Deborah Arnott at Ash. Um, so Harriet, um, you say there'll be no rotation of the Australian picture warnings, but that that will be reviewed. Do you have any idea of the timescale of that review? Um, obviously, there's been an announcement that a new tobacco control plan will be due to be published in July 2021, and really that that topic will be crucial. Thank, yes, thanks, Deborah. That's a very good question. Um, yes, like I said before, for the time being, there'll be one set of pictures and um, Australia is a global leader in tobacco control, um, like us in the UK, and their picture warnings have been evaluated and assessed as very effective. Um, for now, the one set of Australian pictures are sufficient to deter smokers and we secured them at no cost to the taxpayer. Um, we also consulted with international experts around creating our own picture library, which would, would be, take around one to two years um, in order to produce new or original content. In regards to the tobacco control plan, the, um, the, the plan is currently still in development stage and any content or timescales attached to this are to be confirmed. And in regards to picture warnings in the tobacco control plan, we will consider this, but it's likely to be a longer term um, solution um, rather than a shorter term as it in will involve legislative changes, costs and implementation time. But yes, it definitely will be something that we were reviewing because we do appreciate that rotating picture warnings is crucial. 
Great. Okay. Thank you, Harriet. Um, we've got a question here again now. So this is coming back to Martin, please. Um, what is happening on the complaint raised about the tobacco companies circumventing the ban on menthol? Is Public Health England taking responsibility for this now that we're leaving the EU? Okay, thanks, Catherine. I, I, I touched upon this in my slides, but uh, yeah, conscious, uh, it was just a brief run through. So, um, yes, the ban on menthol flavoring came into effect in May. Uh, since then, there have been uh, numerous complaints and lots of noise about um, tobacco companies trying to circumnavigate that that regulation. Um, it's it's a tricky one to uh, enforce. They're getting into too much detail because the way that the regulation is worded, it is about uh, cigarettes or tobacco with a, uh, cigarettes with a, a menthol flavoring so it's not just the presence of any menthol within the cigarettes if, if it were that it would be fairly black and white decision wouldn't it but it, this is about whether the end user gets a, a, a sensation a taste of menthol uh, as the user of that cigarette so it's slightly more subjective than that uh, as we're part of the eu uh, we are obliged to work with the EU on, uh, on issues exactly such as this. So at the moment, the Commission is working specifically with Sweden uh, to undertake an investigation into this issue. We'd, we had hoped that that might conclude whilst we remained a member of the EU. It's clearly looking now as though that's not likely to be the case. So uh, we have already taken steps to start commissioning our own independent investigation, and that will likely be twofold one is a, a lab testing function to see um whether menthol or menthol substitutes are present in some of these um products that are under investigation across the eu uh, uh, followed by some kind of user group sampling to, to see what kind of sensation they get from using the products this is a really delicate area in terms of the legislation but also just in terms of legality. So we need, I appreciate that from the field, it, it, it might seem like this is taking forever and it is taking time, but we need to make sure that we're doing this the right way because um, it may result in us uh, telling tobacco manufacturers that they need to take some of their products off the markets. And uh, so we need to be making sure mm -hmm. that we're following steps all the way through there. Okay, thanks, Martin. And I'll just turn to Kate and Jane. I don't know if there's any, Thing kind of you know what's actually happening on the on the ground around this are, are you finding you know that there are products out there which are i mean some are clearly some circumventing the ban and legally available but others you know appear to have menthol flavorings but claim not not to be um just wondering what your experiences in this area might be kate if you can kind of cover the bit about officers picking up product maybe uh, locally I can certainly just make a brief comment about contact with colleagues that are trying to deal with the large tobacco manufacturers so we've been in constant contact with colleagues in those relevant local authorities and with colleagues at PHE and DHSE throughout this um, which has been in enormously valuable but as Martin said you know these steps have got to be taken really slowly and really carefully so that we do everything right um, Kate I don't know whether you can comment on kind of local level? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so I think since the uh, introduction of the TRPRs and um, the, the timescales that we've gone through um, as menthol has been phased out and so on, we've seen all sorts of um, attempts to bypass the regulations and in fact loads of products that come out that we go back to the regulations and we check how we enforce and we realize we can't enforce so it's not just around the characterizing flavors it's around um uh, menthol uh, sorry um uh, nicotine pouches for example uh, herbal cigarettes for smoking lots of things come out so i think harriet mentioned that the consultation the post uh, implementation review of the trprs and the spot regulations will be taking place very soon. Um, so there's there's plenty for us to report back on then, um, because as I say, it feels like um, it, it, any tiny loophole somebody's using to, to try and get a product onto the market at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we've got a key opportunity there to, to, to flag that. <clears throat> Thank you, Kate, Jane. 
And Martin, Martin, I'm, I'm just going to come back to you again, if that's okay. We've got press, a couple of questions here around age verification. So one's from Bruce Ironmonger, who asks, what do you require as a minimum age verification? Um, and also from B McGinley, um, with the recent work being done around online harms, do you foresee a standard for online age verification processes? Yes. So at the moment, uh, the, the regulations are very... Um very light touch around age verification it, it is literally just uh, there has to be a requirement to ask the question about um whether you're of a legal age to buy cigarettes and there's no then further follow-up you don't have to enter a date of birth you don't have to enter any kind of id or anything to to, to validate that it is literally the requirement is to have a question online so um so we appreciate that's that's not really going to deter anybody that's got the remotest motivation to do that so again i come back to the um the uh the the review that's going to, going to be happening around these regulations uh in the first half of this year and age verification is something that we're we're keen to look at and also keen i think we're quite open-minded to look at um ways of improving that and what may be happening about um other products that have an age of sale limit and how they've um come up with systems that are perhaps more effective than what we've got at the moment. So we're keen to learn from other topics and other areas. And uh, if anybody's on the on the call, it sounds like there might be that's got some uh, expertise around this and some thoughts about um, how we could strengthen that, then I would definitely urge them to respond to that consultation or indeed to drop me a line after this uh, mm -hmm. webinar too. Excellent, thank you. Um, there is a a question here from Gordon McQuillan who um who asks can anyone answer if there is a decision to be made soon on cigarillo products now I'm just wondering in which context Gordon is posing this question whether it's around kind of menthol cigarillos and whether they'll be brought in line um with other cigarettes that, that you know that can't feature menthol products um, does anyone have anything they want to add on on this the issue of cigarillos um, and hopefully that that will answer um gordon's question um not without sounding like a broken record but yes we're, we're aware of the issues around them and the uh yes the issues around menthol and uh, yeah. just the, the tobacco um, leaves and, and, and as part of the um the review process that's going on that is yet another area that we're that we're looking at tightening up. This is this is quite useful to me because we've got a um, we've got a list of about a dozen issues that we want to look at as part of that review that we want to flag up, and uh, colleagues on the call have already flagged up about four of them. So that's gratifying to know that you're having the same kind of thoughts that we are uh, as well around that. Excellent. Thank you, Martin. Craig, can I can I bring you in here? We've got a question here. Um, from Deborah, and it's um, for the MHRA. Have the MHRA identified any options for improving the regulations on e-cigarettes after we leave the EU? Um, well, we'll certainly be involved in the consultation. Um, it's a difficult one. Our, our role is to assess the notification of products. Obviously, the um, we feed back the frailties that we find in data and in the current EU system um, to the Commission while we've been in and, and uh, we, we have regular communications with the um, Department of Health and PHE um, around uh, all the, the issues, tobacco and e-cigarettes. So the, the lessons learned, uh, particularly in reviewing data from submitters and the way it's processed through EUSEG is something that we've taken on board um, with the, the build of the GB system, and that's why we will be going into redevelopment as soon as we leave. Like I said, it's not just about the publication side of things, it's also about um, having a system that carries out uh, mandatory checks um, so that our manual assessors don't need to, and they can focus then more on the technical scientific data. So, but the changes to the regulations isn't really um, something that we can talk about. Obviously, like I say, we do feed the information back to um, the relevant bodies when it comes to drafting legislation. Uh, but yeah, we just look after the notification requirements. Thank you, Craig. Thank you for addressing that. I've got a question here from Ailsa Rutter at Fresh. Um, there's a 
it might be best posed to, to Harriet or to Martin, is there an opportunity to get rid of tar and nicotine carbon monoxide levels? How useful do you think they are really? So is there an opportunity to get rid of those levels? I think I'll pass that one on to Martin, if that's okay. I was about to do the same to you, Howard. That's 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 fine. <laughs> um, I guess from the consumer's point of view, I think uh, Alps is right. Uh, I guess this kind of all goes back to when cigarettes were labelled as 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 mild or had the kind of misleading labels associated to them it didn't really mean much, and there was a commitment to kind of publish more data or to, to include more data about specifically what was in the products. How how useful that is to the end user, I'm not entirely convinced uh, i think it is it is interesting how we see mm. some of the, the tar and uh, nicotine and, and carbon monoxide levels or the emission levels uh, vary within products so I, I think the i think the testing part is still useful i think without regulations around that we still see products at the moment that exceed the uh, maximum levels and we kind of clamp down on that as soon as we see that and i think if that if that weren't in place then uh, i think tobacco industry kind of given the reg given the regulations have been placed around them about um, advertising and promotion and the packaging I think they'll always try and find a way of, of differentiating their products on the market so I think it's good to have them there from a, a technical point of view to try, try and keep a cap on the industry but from yes I agree with Alice from the individual smokers perspective I'm not not entirely sure uh, it's a, a huge value and there may very well be other things and I'm, I'm Kind of speaking out of turn here but there may be other things that we that we want to look to be testing in cigarettes down in the future as well which might have more value uh, and again that's something we can be in discussion with the department of health about great thank you thanks martin um craig if i can just come back to you we, we, we've just had a follow-up um following on from your earlier helpful um answer so the the changes sound really good on notification. Do you have any up-to-date information that you can share with us on the systems for monitoring adverse reactions to e-cigarettes? Um, and then again, as a follow-up, how many notifications have you received, whether they're going up or down, or if they're staying very similar, what proportion are minor? Are you able to add some context to that topic? Yep, sure. So adverse reactions, um, we maintain obviously the yellow card system, which captures that. Uh, we also require um, businesses, manufacturers to provide us their data on a regular basis. We carried out um, systematic requests for uh, adverse reaction data um, in the early part of last year. Um, we've actually um, we've taken some action against businesses that have failed to do so. Um, so we will also be publishing as of um, January. We'll be publishing uh, adverse reactions on our yeah on from yellow cards um, on the e-cigarette page. So you'll be able to access a monthly um, update of what's going on in that area. Um, it's still very very low. Um, if you're looking for what are we getting on on a sort of a, a wholesale level adverse reactions comparative to the, the types of things we've seen in America around the E-Valley outbreak are incredibly low comparative to the usage in the UK uh, and the amount of products that we have available on the market. Um, coming back around to products we have available on the market, um, we have around 45,000 floating up and down uh, on a monthly basis at the moment. It does seem that our increase is very much slowed. Now, uh, obviously, that is potentially due to COVID, people are putting less products on the market because maybe sales are down. But we had started to see this, um, this sort of slowing and, and semi-balancing. We generally get around 6,000 notifications per year. Um, and the publication is currently, currently we've got 2,000 products under review. So um, we don't just allow these products to come straight through. There is, as I say, uh, there's an automated system of, of checks and a manual system of checks. Anything that we are concerned about then goes through a very uh, robust method of internal assessment with other scientific advisors involved. Have I missed, have I missed a part of that question or did I capture it all? 
it sounds like you've captured it all. So it was around notifications going up or down, and um, they're staying similar, what proportion are minor. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you probably covered all of those points, Craig. So thank you for, for addressing that. Um, if there was anything, don't worry, we will we will we will ask you. Um, so, I mean, panelists, that has been really helpful. Before I formally, well, before I close the Q and A session, I just wonder if I can ask each panelist, and I haven't given you notice of this. I'm sorry. Um, so I will put put you on the spot slightly. Um, we, I mean, no, we've got we've had around 270 people dialing into this webinar they'll be from a variety of backgrounds both regulatory and public health colleagues and um, i guess from a regulatory perspective I, i'd like to ask each panelist what would be your kind of key um message to colleagues on the call as we um you know approach the first of january what would be your kind of key message to them kind of relating to your to your topic area so if harriet if i can if i can put you on the spot first please Yes, thanks, Catherine. Um, obviously, that's a re really good question. And we've spent, um, I mean, over the last year, nearly two years working on these EU exit regulations. But um, throughout the whole time, um, it's always been about making sure that we continue our robust levels of tobacco control legislation. And despite the fact there will be different um, pictures on packaging in Northern Ireland and GB, um, they will still be serving a tobacco control purpose and we will still be committed to deterring people from smoking uh, and this will be, remain central for everything we do. Great, yes, and I, I definitely endorse that, absolutely. Um, Craig, I'll move to you please, what would be your main message to those on the, on the webinar this morning? Um, my main message would be uh, to make sure that you are contacting the MHRA if you need support, if you're you know, investigating cases, if you're unsure about products, uh, if you can't find them on our huge list. Um, the, the team is now set up and has been for the last couple of years to work very closely with enforcement agencies. Um, the information about contacting the notification team is on our webpage. Um, we are always happy to assist enforcers whether that's just providing data, spreadsheets, uh, information on a product, um, statements. Uh, we will do everything we can to support um, trading standards authorities and other investigating agencies. So, yeah, don't please don't think that we're an impenetrable wall. Um, you can come direct to the team uh, and we'll do everything we can to assist. That's excellent. Thank you, Craig. That's really good to know. Martin, I'll move to you. Thanks, Catherine. I think my answer will probably be less to do with the, the TPD competent authority role and more from PHE's perspective more generally, um, kind of having worked with Catherine in the Northeast and kind of seeing the work that goes on around training standards and particularly on kind of clamping down on illegal and illicit tobacco. It's hugely important. I think only only going to become more so as we have the 2030 smoke-free commitments and Harriet's already mentioned about the new tobacco control plan. I'm, I'm sure Again, thinking ahead, that will have a lot in there about the levelling up agenda and um, trying to reduce smoking amongst our most deprived communities. And we know that the presence of illegal tobacco can, can undermine a lot of really good work around that. And I, and I know how difficult it is for local colleagues out there with funding and capacity at the moment. Hopefully, the Tobacco Control Plan will will, will be joined by a, a commitment to uh, to more work around this field. And, and, and with that will come... Uh, more capacity, but uh, we live in hope. But um, it, it's hugely important work that everybody's doing. Uh, I think it's only going to become more important over the next few uh, months and years as we as we look to um, build towards that 2030 agenda. Brilliant. Yeah, Martin, we've, we've got a lot a lot to work towards there. So thank you, Jane. Oh, thank you, Catherine. I've just got a couple of things to say. Uh, firstly, a big thank you to my trading standards colleagues for all the work they continue to do on tobacco control, despite uh, numerous challenges. Um, we've mentioned the sanctions consultation earlier on. So a plea, really. Uh, CTSI will be responding to this and we'll do that in the normal way through tobacco focus group members. So if you have the opportunity to contribute to that, please do. It's really important. We've already done some pre-work on it. Uh, HMRC didn't engage us before the publication, so we're kind of a bit ahead of the game there. 
and just following on from Martin's point there about you know this huge significance of illegal tobacco can I just also say to colleagues for those of you that will be engaged in Operation CC which is due to start on January the 1st this is our major um, NTS funded from HMRC work on illegal tobacco. Really good luck with that. It's a fantastic opportunity and I'm sure we will all do very well. And happy Christmas, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Kate, I'm going to ask you to put yours in writing and we'll send it round. We're up against it for time. There's another webinar, can you believe it, starting right now. So I'm just going to say thank you to all of the panellists for joining and dealing so well with all of the questions. Huge thanks to the at attendees. Really great that you've taken the time out to join this. Um, all the best to you all and we'll be back in touch soon with all of the slides, the recording and, um, and the follow-up documents. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye.